Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 10,000 Startups Podcast. My name is Roger Royce. I'm your host for each week. We bring you original content on topics of interest to startups on legal issues, startup law. And this week, we're going to do something a little bit different. I don't have a guest here. It's going to be me talking to you. And I'm going to talk about a topic that is super important to every startup company, and that is qualified small business stock. Now, in case you don't know what qualified small business stock is, let me just give you the high level. Uh, if you're a non-corporate taxpayer, an individual, and if you sell qualified small business stock after five years of holding it, you can exclude from your federal taxable income all of your gain from the sale of that stock up to the greater of $10 million or 10 times your cost basis in that stock. So let me say that again. You're an individual. You have qualified small business stock. You hold it five years. You sell it at a humongous gain. You can exclude $10 million or, if greater, 10 times your cost of that stock from tax, from federal income tax. It is a huge benefit. It is a huge benefit, and it drives a lot of the planning that goes on here in Silicon Valley among the investment community and even among the startups. Now, let's we're going to drill down for the next 30 minutes on what this all means. And the first thing I think I'd like to tell you about is this is a federal income tax benefit. Uh, California, for example, does not conform. They did it one time. They don't anymore. So you're not going to get out of California income taxes on the sale of your stock if you're unfortunate enough to live here. But on the other hand, you will avoid federal income tax. So it's still worthwhile given what individual tax rates are. Uh, and even if you would otherwise get capital gains treatment, that's still 20% you don't pay. Now, what does it take uh, in order to qualify for this benefit? Again, at a high level, uh, the stock has to be issued at original issuance. I'll talk more about what that means. Basically, it's by the corporation uh, and not from some third party shareholder. Uh, you have to meet a five-year holding period. In other words, you buy the stock, you hold it for five years before you sell it. And before September 27, 2010, you got less than 100% exclusion. It was 75 and it was 50%. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that because I don't deal that much with companies that are that old anymore. In startup land, that's three lifetimes. Uh, the company that issues a stock has to have more, ha, I'm sorry, has to have less than $50 million of gross assets as of the date of issuance. It has to meet an active business test and it has to have avoided having significant redemptions. Okay, let's drill. Now, before I drill down on each of these requirements, um, the very first thing you should be asking yourself is, gee, does this mean that we should not be an S Corp? or an LLC, which are pass-throughs, and we should be a C-corporation. Keep in mind, a C-corporation is taxed twice. It's taxed on its earnings as it's earned, and then, and then the shareholders are taxed again when those earnings are distributed as a dividend. Uh, if somebody sells the assets of a C-corp, you've got that double tax because the corporation gets taxed, and then the corporate has to liquidate and pay out its shareholders. That's the general, all right? Uh, and let's say we have a sale of stock, well, then the corporation has that corporate tax trapped inside this inside uh, the corporate shell because eventually those assets, theoretically anyway, are going to come out of corporate solution. So C Corp just carries a double tax with it wherever it goes. Um, a pass through, on the other hand, an S corporation or an LLC is not a tax paying entity; it is a tax reporting entity. The owners of that entity actually pay tax on the income of the entity. Now, they might pay it at a really high rate. Uh, there is a, a, a deduction available to some corporations uh, that allow it to reduce that rate by 20%. But otherwise, it could be up to 37%. Uh, corporations, they pay tax at a 21% corporate tax rate. This is all federal, by the way, ignoring uh, state taxes. Uh, however, the uh, distribution from the corporation uh, could actually qualify if it's liquidation of the corporation for a QSBS benefit. So you might get away with a 21% rate in total uh, on the sale of assets of a corporation. 
uh, as opposed to a 0% rate on the sale of stock if it's QSBS. In contrast that to an S Corp or LLC, where you're going to have on a sale of stock or assets, you're going to have a, a tax uh, at probably at least at 20% federal capital gains rate and maybe more in certain assets. Okay, so that's the background. So the, 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 the takeaway from this is that you can't beat a zero rate of federal tax. And that's what you get with QSBS if we can have a sale of stock, which is most of the exits I do, by the way, is simply a stock sale or a transaction treated like a stock sale. All right, let's talk a little bit more about some of the requirements. First of all, shareholder requirements. The stock has to be acquired by the shareholder at original issuance. Now, what do I mean by that term, original issuance? It means the corporation has sold you its stock. It means you didn't buy it from somebody else in a secondary sale. It wasn't issued to Mr. Founder and then Mr. or Mrs. Founder sold the stock to you, taxpayer, uh, subsequent. That would not be original issuance. That would be a secondary transaction. That stock would not qualify for QSBS. Um, it has to be acquired in exchange for money, property, or services, um, which means that you didn't uh, trade other stock for it, in effect, uh, with some certain narrow exceptions that I'll talk about later. Uh, but generally, for money, property, or services, where this comes up is somebody um, basically wants to uh, drop their stock into another corporation and uh, end up with QSBS in that stock. Uh, unless it is a certain type of reorganization, uh, that's not going to work. So be careful about that. Uh, options are not stock, so therefore they're not QSBS. However, an option is a right to buy stock, uh, and that's what an exercise is, right? So somebody exercises an option, and they, in effect, buy stock. That stock could be QSBS if we meet all the other requirements. The one tricky one about this is that you want to be sure that that option is exercised at a time when the company is worth less than $50 million, which you might not have a lot of visibility into if you're not a founder. And keep it, remember, $50 million is not fair value. It's cash plus tax basis of assets. Uh, so exercise early if you're concerned about uh, QSBS treatment. Uh, the other thing to note about options is that that five-year holding period I told you about, that's going to start running on the date of exercise, not on the date of grant of your option. Keep that in mind. So the question always comes up, what about safes? Okay, um, what is a safe? Uh, is if I get a safe and if we you do a transaction and we cash out my safe in that transaction, do I get QSBS treatment? Uh, alternatively, Suppose uh, the investor buys a safe uh, in year one. In year three, the safe converts into um, stock. And in year six, the company gets sold and the safe stock is sold. Do we get QSBS treatment? And the answer is maybe. Uh, there are a lot of tax practitioners who will take the position that a safe is stock for this purpose. Now, I got to tell you that that is an untested position with the IRS. And, uh, you can see that uh, there may be some arguments with that position because a safe uh, certainly isn't debt, at least, I mean, it doesn't bear interest or have a fixed repayment date. Um, but is it really stock? Uh, it sounds a lot like a contract, right? A forward contract is a contract to acquire property at a later date. A prepaid forward contract is a forward contract that you pay for in advance. A safe sounds like a prepaid forward contract, which is not stock. Nevertheless, it's very common for taxpayers and their advisors to take the position that safes are stock and they are stock on day one. So in that scenario where the safe gets cashed out or it converts to stock and then the stock gets sold, uh, taxpayers will claim the QSBS benefit. I haven't heard of anyone being challenged on that yet, uh, but I think the IRS... Uh, just hasn't gotten around to it. Uh, the other thing issued to note is QSPS gets issued to an individual and they go to the estate planner and the estate planner says, gee, let's use a family limited partnership so we can get some gifting discounts. 
Uh, well, once that QS business is contributed to an LLC taxed as a partnership, we now lose the QSBS treatment because the partnership uh, is not the holder of that stock at original issuance. So that's a problem. Uh, exchange funds, take. let's all take our stock and drop them into an exchange fund. It's going to defeat your QSBS treatment. Another thing to be careful about. Company requirements. Remember what I said, $50 million is our number that we're watching out for. As I mentioned, that's not fair market value. That's cash and tax basis. Company has to be worth less than that at the date of issuance of that stock in order for it to be QSBS. And as I mentioned earlier, it's got to be a C corporation that issues a stock, not an S corp or an LLC. Um, when do we measure? All right. Let's suppose our company is just a little bit under $50 million. We do a financing. And once you add all the cash and the financing uh, into the pot, we get more than 50 million. Well, we're gonna measure this right before the close of the financing with respect to the stock issued in the financing. Uh, another requirement is that the company be engaged in a qualified trader business, meaning that 80% at least of company assets must be used in a qualified trader business. So there's a little bit of ambiguity and vagary around the term qualified trader business, We've got some rulings that kind of go all over the place on this, but generally there are some things that the statute will specifically exclude. Take a hard look at it, you know, professional services, insurance, et cetera. Um, and then where we really have to uh, have to maybe take a little risk on this is when we have consulting services. So I can't give you a definitive answer. That's a very fact specific case, but be mindful that the company has to be engaged in a qualified trader business as determined by the statute and regulations. And that will typically exclude a lot of services businesses. Working capital. So let's imagine that the company um, is a typical startup company and they raise a bunch of cash and they don't have really anything else on their balance sheet like most of my startups. They've just gone from formation to series seed. And all of a sudden, they've got a uh, million dollars of cash, and that's pretty much it, right? Um, well, cash is not an active trader business asset, is it? So we've got a working capital safe harbor, fortunately, uh, providing that no more than half the value of the company can be in working capital. Uh, so as long as we're not over half in working capital, we're okay on that. So something to be careful about. Uh, however, when it comes to other types of assets, uh, real estate, stock, stock or securities, not more than 10% of the value uh, can be held in real estate, stock or securities. Redemptions. Um, this is another area where it's really easy to get in trouble. So uh, there's two major redemption rules. So number one is with respect to a particular taxpayer. So if that taxpayer gets shares that are issued within two years before or two years after the um, a redemption uh, of shares from that taxpayer, then they may not have qualified small business stock. Let me give you an example. Um, tax, uh, company redeems from taxpayer a bunch of stock uh, in year one. Uh, in year two, it issues that taxpayer some additional stock um, well, we might be in trouble here because now we've got uh, an issuance within two years uh, of a redemption. And that's the problem. That's the problem. Um, second redemption rule uh, is with respect to the company generally. And if shares are issued one year before or after a 5% redemption uh, to anybody, may not be QSBS. And by the way, the first rule applies not only to taxpayers, but also related parties to taxpayers. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a sneaky one. Now, fortunately, there are ex exemptions to both of those. There's a de minimis exemption, $10,000 or 2% of the company, or the one we always rely on, termination of employment, because people terminate and they sell their vested, unvested shares back to the company. That's excluded from this redemption rule. It also transfers in connection with death, divorce, et cetera. Now, where people run into this has to do with secondary sales. Because in secondary sales, 
we oftentimes have uh, will have a founder selling shares to a third party buyer. That is that is how a secondary typically works. Third party buyer might want to instead buy the shares directly from the company and have the company redeem the founder. Well, now we've got a redemption problem. And the tax risk on this is we always worry about that sale to the third party being recharacterized by the IRS as just a disguised redemption. So I'm just saying there's an issue there. Some of the planning considerations around this is uh, uh, number one, what happens if we're stuck in an S corporation? Uh, then what do we do? Uh, remember, I told you that only a, a C corporation can issue qualify small business stock. Well, what if we got an S corporation? Then what? Are we just really stuck now? Well, there are some ways that we can maybe deal with that. And one is to drop the assets down into a new C corporation and take back stock in the S corporation in exchange. That stock to be held by the S corporation could be qualified small business stock. And that's the usual way of dealing with this problem. Um, what if the S corporation terminates its S election and issues shares to a new investor? Well, that works for the new investor. The stock that they're getting is going to be QSBS. It doesn't do much good to the existing shareholders who were issued shares at a time it was an S corp. So we really have to do some reorganizing in order to make this work. And keep in mind, it's got to be assets for stock. Uh, can't be stock of an S corp in exchange for stock of the C corp because that's not money or other property. Okay, planning. Um, <clears throat> LLCs, what if we've got an LLC uh, that wants to get QSBS benefits? Well, remember an LLC is not a C Corp. LLC tax is a partnership, so it can't issue QSBS. But what it can do is it can incorporate, right? And there's three ways to incorporate, all of which involve by definition a transfer of assets, property, money or other property for stock uh, at original issuance. So the LLC can do this. Now, the interesting thing here is in that scenario, or in any scenario where we've got a 351 transaction or we're transferring property for stock, uh, the cost of the stock for purposes of QSBS exclusion, uh, the number 10 times cost, the cost is going to be the value of that property. So if the LLC is worth $2 million, at the time it gets transferred into the new C Corp in exchange for QSBS, well, the exemption is 2 million times 10, $20 million. That's the good news. The bad news is that first 2 million of appreciation in the LLC assets are going to be tax, taxable, taxable I should say, on a sale of the new QSBS stock down the road. And this assumes that all the other requirements are met, qualified business, uh, the size requirement, the holding requirement, the redemption requirement, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> one of the things you might have been hearing a lot about is stacking exemptions through gifting, because this exemption applies on a taxpayer by taxpayer basis. And there is a rule that a taxpayer can gift QSBS to somebody. And if they're gifted QSBS, well, that QSBS is going to be QSBS stock in the hands of the donee, as long as it was in the hands of the donor. Well, think about that. Um, you've got three kids, you've got QSBS, you give stock to three of them instead of a $10 million exclusion amount, you know, $30 million. That's the idea of stacking. And there are some very aggressive structures out there using trusts, uh, estate planning trust to, to stack even further uh, within these exemptions. It's, it's almost a repeal of the income tax uh, on uh, purchase and sale of startup company stock. Uh, a couple, One other thing I want to mention, and this is way more aggressive, is there's some real ambiguity and vagary in the language about how much the exemption is for somebody married filing jointly. Some people think it's 10 million. Some people think it's 20 million. Um, <clears throat> I'll just say that there's some ambiguity and without taking a position and some lawyers will say it's a $20 million exemption. Uh, I'm not saying it is, I'm saying there's ambiguity in the way it's drafted. Doesn't really make sense, but people take that position. And then finally, 
well, gee, that five, this all sounds great, except I can't make the five million. So uh, what else can I do? Well, you've got 60 days to roll over your gain into new qualified small business stock if you've not met the five-year requirement and you avoid gain on the amount rolled over. And that is something to really keep in mind if you haven't met that time period. And some people will even roll that gain over into a brand new corporation that they form to go out and conduct an honest, legitimate, qualified trade or business. Uh, maybe that works. Uh, the important thing is, is, is you've got a very short fuse on this. Uh, but if you do that, then you can tack the holding period and you just uh, continue on and wait until your five-year period has, has run and then you can sell free of tax. So that's it for Qualify Small Business Stock. This is Roger Royce, 10,000 Startups. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week.